I'm King Lincoln. Today I hope you join me in a journey into the past. You probably can tell where we're going from the title of this video, but I want to take you back to the days of Super Nintendo, Nintendo's second major console, which was life-changing for me. It's where I finally adopted my moniker from a little game called The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, which is still one of my favorite games. But on that console, there were two other games that stood out, and they were almost as powerful as A Link to the Past. They were Final Fantasy II and Final Fantasy III, sequential games in the franchise. Which, of course, is completely wrong, as probably everyone knows. Final Fantasy II was the fourth game in the series, Final Fantasy III was Final Fantasy VI, and of course, the versions we got in America were, well, lacked quite a bit. The thing is, Final Fantasy IV and Final Fantasy VI, I'll use their true names for this video, have always stuck with me. The opening scene from Final Fantasy IV was incredible at the time and still stands out now. It was a cutscene in a video game, in engine, where the characters moved around and you really could feel what was happening. I remember recreating this multiple times with Legos or different toys. This might not be as incredible today, but damn, this opening still gets me excited for the epic story. Final Fantasy VI on the other hand is equally amazing, but the scene that always stood out is of course, the opera. This was just one of the moments I played over and over, even singing along, I won't be singing here, your ears can thank me later. These are both moments that elevated what games could do and be. They showed that players could ask for more from a story than a few lines of dialogue or a cutscene at the beginning and end of a game. They showed that games were growing more complex. But the thing is, Final Fantasy IV is good and Final Fantasy VI is good, but over the years I've spent a lot of time trying to decide which one was better between them. So let's solve that once and for all. I'm going to be breaking down each game and figuring out which game did each part better, and that's what we're here for. Now if you want to get just to the meat of this video, feel free to jump to the next chapter or the time on screen, but before we get started, there is one big elephant in the room that I need to address. That's going to be which version to play. I'm going to be cutting a lot of this discussion out, but my favorite versions for this game are the Game Boy Advance versions for their bonus dungeons. Though, I do think the Super NES graphics are flawless and probably can't be improved upon. But I also want to talk about which game was best at launch, not which game has the best stuff added into it, and for that we're going to go with the Super Nintendo versions, with one big caveat. Final Fantasy IV. The original Super Nintendo games were heavily edited and censored from the Japanese counterparts, and while Final Fantasy VI removed some content, Final Fantasy IV's translation well, has never really sat well with me. The main complaint I have is that Cecil's actions at the beginning and how the King of Baron reacts just don't really make a lot of sense at the beginning of the game. So when playing through it this time and trying to judge it for this video, I'm actually going to be using the Naming Way edition from Rodimus Primal, which tries to restore the original Japanese scripts without changing too much and does a good job as you'll see on the screen. He also has a Ted Woosley uncensored version from Final Fantasy VI, but I choose not to use that for reasons that would take a really long time to explain, mostly achievement related. I will be linking both versions in the description. Anyways, with that figured out, I have played through both of these titles, and now we can see which one is better. So I divided this up into five categories. I'm going to heavily try to avoid spoilers. I will be forced to hint at certain things, but I'm going to avoid going into too much so new players can fully enjoy these games. The battleground for this versus will be the following. The character, the story, the combat, the world map, and the bosses. I also haven't predetermined the outcome of course, I do have my favorite, but the goal here is to look at the pieces that make each game great to make that determination. I'm avoiding graphics and sound which puts Final Fantasy IV at a minor disadvantage just because it came out three years earlier. Of course Final Fantasy VI should look better, also both of these games have amazing soundtracks where I really doubt I could choose a favorite. So with that said, let's get on to the first discussion, the characters. We start with Final Fantasy IV and that amazing opening I talked about. We have our Dark Knight Cecil who steals a crystal from what appears to be a peaceful kingdom. Early on, Cecil works with his friend Kane, and he is in love with Rosa and meets a young summoner named Rydia, as well as eight other characters for a total of 12. Each character has an individual arc, but many of them only join the party for a short time. The party in Final Fantasy IV is chosen by the story, and that means many characters will join and leave the party multiple times, but that also means the characters themselves have a limited amount of time for development. I've always been a big fan of Tella the Great Sage, but when replaying this game, I realize he's only truly part of this party for a couple hours, and this is a big problem for the character development. That's true for many characters here, and it's such a shame because they could really be incredible on their own. 
The biggest issue I have with Final Fantasy IV is when people just call it a love story. Yes, there is Cecil and Rosa, but my god, if you read it online, it sounds like some epic romance, and sadly, it really isn't. They start in love, they end in love, and they almost feel indifferent towards each other throughout the game. It's a shame because people call it a major theme of the game, and you know, I don't buy it. On the other hand, Final Fantasy VI has 14 characters, but in this game the majority of the characters join the party and remain, at least for most of the adventure, and that's not even counting a couple additional characters who join for a few battles. The game starts with an enigmatic girl named Terra, who is a member of the Empire and is quickly saved by a thief, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, treasure hunter named Locke. But what really elevates the characters in Final Fantasy VI is how long the player spends with everyone. You'll spend at least 10 hours with most of the characters in the game, and even are given the ability to choose your party quite often, but that also allows for more development over that time. It also helps that it doesn't really feel like many games where every character has to say something during each scene, but major characters do get a chance to speak up. Since almost no one leaves the party, players will have to choose which characters to take with them, and that may create some issues since a decent number of the scenes are also optional, so they are easy to miss. Such as this scene where the game dives into the royal brothers, Edgar and Sabin's past, showing how Sabin left their kingdom, and later we can even understand a little more about that coin that was used. But to me, it's not a fair question. While Cecil remains with the party at all times in Final Fantasy IV and gets the best development, he's actually the exception. Almost every character in Final Fantasy VI has more development, and because of that, I have to say that Final Fantasy VI has better characters. But that's really not everything, and it's a double-edged sword. Which leads us to... Story. So with Final Fantasy VI having better characters, it's obvious it's going to have the best story, and repeating this section doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Well, that's kind of the problem, because the chosen party is so free-form, the story has problems because of it. If the player doesn't take Edgar and Sabin to the castle as we saw, we don't learn about their past, and it's hard to call optional content a core part of the story. One of the strongest parts of Final Fantasy VI, in my opinion, is the romance between Locke and Celis. Actually, I would put that as one of the strongest romantic relationships between any of the Final Fantasy characters. However, that relationship is mostly built on these optional moments, and would be extremely easy to miss some of them, potentially all of them. There's also no true main character in Final Fantasy VI. That makes for a stronger game for the player because of the ability to choose who to focus on, but the lack of requiring specific characters means the game is forced to search for someone to carry the main narrative in each scene. Sometimes a game does require certain characters, but for the most part, they can't rely on someone being part of the party. The problem only gets worse over time, and while I'm not going to be showing any part of it, in the second half of the game, if you know what I'm talking about, the lack of a main character is noticeable when the game just throws out generic quotes because it really doesn't take the time to attribute those statements to any party member, and that honestly feels awkward. And with that, we'll look at Final Fantasy IV, which again, has characters that don't linger around for that long as I mentioned before, but the fact is each of these characters joining and leaving the party makes for a more interesting story. Rather than a large resistance, Final Fantasy IV's tale is more unique as players greet new characters and have to bid farewell to many of their friends, often abruptly. And that's what really makes Final Fantasy IV's story stand out, because losing someone is a more impactful event than collecting a bunch of characters and never using most of them. R.I.P. Gal, he's dead to me. And sure, there are at least two or three amazing epic moments in Final Fantasy VI, but four has those moments throughout the entire game. Even seeing Tella storm off and leave your group of friends, or your entire party thrown overboard with players wondering if they'll ever see those other characters again, is always going to be more impactful because it's controlled by the writer. And of course, this also leads to the major event of Cecil's arc, the great change that happens to him, which develops the story more as the core narrative of Final Fantasy IV is a tale about redemption, and we can see that in so many of the individual characters' arcs. Now, the one issue I have with Final Fantasy IV's story is the final act, which, again, I'm going to be avoiding spoiling as much as I can, however, pretty much everything leading up to and in that final dungeon is weak. I'd say the final boss just comes out of nowhere, I've never really thought the end of Final Fantasy IV lives up to the previous 20 or so hours, which is damn near perfect. It's an ending that I would say the game didn't deserve. But outside of that, I would have to admit that Final Fantasy IV's story here is far better. I just called it perfect a second ago. Weaving a story that keeps players on their toes and constantly focused on their current task produces a better told story. The sad part is it does limit the player's ability to focus on the characters that they enjoyed playing as, which definitely should affect our next category. Combat. Final Fantasy IV and VI both are traditional Japanese RPGs with turn-based combat. 
Final Fantasy IV introduced gamers to active time battles, where characters could ready attacks at different speeds, and the abilities characters chose could matter to their order. And this Final Fantasy IV helped define the genre, but it also made a change to the franchise. In the first Final Fantasy, you chose a party, yourself. In the second, everyone could learn magic. And in Final Fantasy III, we have class-based systems, so again, anyone can use any ability. Final Fantasy IV was the first Final Fantasy games where characters were both rigidly defined and mattered. Granted, this is one of the only Final Fantasies that have a character that permanently can't use magic, possibly the only character in the franchise, but at the same time, that was a different experience and it made for more interesting combat. Your party composition was decided for you, but there was no jack of all trades. Rosa's white magic and Rydia's dark magic were core abilities and couldn't be traded. Cecil was always your warrior, but beyond that, each character had abilities that helped them stand out and allowed you to feel the difference, which also changed up the pace of the game. There are points where magic is at the core of the game and other points where you're focused on brawlers who are just laying waste to enemies. This is one of the biggest reasons I disliked the American version of Final Fantasy IV and how to get a patch. The Japanese version's characters were more unique with each character having their own ability. Cecil using dark attacks that would sacrifice his life force for damage is both a character-defining trait and an interesting attack. And while none of these abilities are required, they help develop who each character is. Then there's Final Fantasy VI, which has more characters, which means more possibilities and special abilities. While that does exist, the truth is only a few abilities in Final Fantasy VI really feel like they matter. Locke can steal, of course, and Edgar can use tools, Sabin can use blitz techniques, and these are all useful, but at the same time Final Fantasy VI does something different. In Final Fantasy VI, the party will eventually earn what are known as espers. Some espers give characters bonuses, but the core use of them is teaching magic to your characters. There are story reasons why this works, but by the end of the game, most of your favorite characters are carrying around a rather serious library of spells. If you know where to find all the espers, your characters can just stroll around with endgame spells for a large portion of the game. The ability for every character to learn magic is the more common approach to magic systems in the Final Fantasy franchise, but it takes something away from the characters themselves where they don't feel that unique. Yes, Locke can steal, and there are some interesting combos such as using the Offering and the Genji Glove to attack 8 total times with 2 weapons attached, but the same combo can actually be used for every character in the game. Even when characters like Edgar and Sabin have abilities that might be more powerful than spells, those abilities don't feel as necessary because of spells. It's possible that this was done so players can choose their favorite characters and not feel like they're missing out on the magic system in the game, but while Final Fantasy VI may have better characters outside of combat, inside they just end up feeling more generic. The thing is that the magic in Final Fantasy VI and the gameplay feel great, but when you take a step back, it's hard to ignore how much better Final Fantasy IV's combat feels. The unique characters in the combat make each battle feel a little more meaningful, and that means you respect the magic more because you're limited to who can cast those spells. But with that, we should be looking at the game world more. And I mean, we'll talk about the combat a bit more before the end with the bosses, but first we need to talk about the world where we find ourselves. That means it's time for the... World Map. Final Fantasy VI's map is huge. While the game starts in a little town called Narshi, there are 30 other locations worth visiting and many will be worth visiting more than once. The towns in Final Fantasy VI can look similar, but every town has a unique layout and almost all of them have a purpose for players to visit, whether it's story related, optional content, or an important collectible. There are also a lot of diversity, including the Opera House, Zozo, the City of Liars, and the Lette River with the famous raft scene. So many of these locations stand out because of how well they're designed, and again, the towns themselves all feel like they have a functional purpose rather than just being yet another town you stop in. Of course, there's the major event that we're going to avoid talking about, but after that point, every location is worth a second visit to learn what has changed and what might now be hiding in locations you've already explored fully once before. The thing is, Final Fantasy VI feels organic in that there are locations that don't directly serve the story at first, locations that might hide optional content or meetings that players might miss out on or not notice at first, and that makes Final Fantasy VI so much more interesting to explore. And then there is Final Fantasy IV's world map, which is also pretty large, though Final Fantasy IV has about half the number of locations that Final Fantasy VI has. As you play through Final Fantasy IV, you'll go to all the corners of the map to fully explore it as well. While most of the areas look lush with greenery, each location feels unique, and each kingdom has a design and a speaking style which actually makes them feel special. The strongest part of Final Fantasy IV is the dungeon design. Every dungeon in Final Fantasy IV is well constructed except that final dungeon which feels like it goes on forever and becomes a little more like a gauntlet. Even when a dungeon is annoying though, it's more because of a unique and interesting limitation such as the Magnet Cave or a certain late game dungeon with a certain wall. Ugh, that one. 
But what I think impresses me with Final Fantasy IV is how after you feel like you've been almost everywhere in the world, well, you're presented with a whole new area, and while this happens far later than I remember, you're probably already two-thirds of the way through the game, it's incredible. And of course, it might even happen a second time. But when I really think about these two worlds, the one that's always interested me more is Final Fantasy VI. The reason is Final Fantasy IV's world is amazing, but it doesn't feel like there's anything outside of what was needed for the story. Compare that to Final Fantasy VI, which has players exploring larger areas and even returning to the same area to discover new experiences. Even something that sounds as simple as a phantom forest has a large, massive dungeon hiding inside of it, and the uniqueness of some of those locations are hard to deny. But each location usually has a purpose, and in an RPG, dungeons usually have something special. That's right, we're going to be talking about... bosses. Final Fantasy IV surprised me when I replayed it. While every dungeon and the gameplay in the game was so well executed, I also couldn't help but notice how every boss was unique. Let me show the first example. The Mist Dragon, for instance, is the first boss players can fight. However, at points during the battle, the Mist Dragon will turn into... Well, you know, myths. And if you attack, it will counterattack. And if you're not paying attention, that's pretty nasty damage. The thing is, every boss has a special ability like this, such as the Mom Bomb, which transforms from a small bomb to a large bomb, and then explodes and appears as six different bombs that need to be taken out. This is a mechanic that is mostly used just for this one fight. Every boss has a unique mechanic, and that made me impressed because so many other Final Fantasy games are still unable to pull this off. It's probably impossible in most others since the parties aren't rigidly enforced. In Final Fantasy 1, players could choose a no magic or only magic party, and if that's their choice, you couldn't design a boss that required a specific technique to beat if the party doesn't have it. So in this, I think Final Fantasy 4 really stands out as something special. And you know, Final Fantasy 6 surprised me as well. So what does Final Fantasy 6 do with this? Well, let's just start and say the bosses in Final Fantasy 6 are far more colorful. Ultros has the most personality of a Final Fantasy 6 enemy, and that's great. He's the perfect enemy to fight in the early game. He is just kind of easy. Kefka also has a lot of personality, but he mostly flees from battles, and actually that's kind of the problem. Where Final Fantasy IV's bosses selection really stood out, I pretty much mentioned the most memorable bosses, well, except for a train that you can suplex if you're man enough, and remember the button combination, of course. But none of these are really that hard or deep. Even the hardest boss, Atma Weapon, the original translation's name, doesn't really stand out that much. As I said, one of the problems is you really can guarantee a specific character is in the party. Even when one is, such as Celeste fighting the tunnel armor, the mechanics at the core of the battle can be ignored and enemies can just be beaten down traditionally. As a side note this time around, I actually didn't power level at all while playing through most of Final Fantasy VI. The bosses were just relatively easy in my opinion. And the thing is, I feel like the final boss and some of the bosses in Final Fantasy VI stand out. I'd be lying if I said Final Fantasy IV's bosses were worse in any way. The fact that each boss stands out in an RPG is impressive, so I have to give this to Final Fantasy IV, which kind of shocks me. With all five categories given out, Final Fantasy VI stands with characters in a better world map, and Final Fantasy IV does have better story, better combat, and better bosses. Coming into this video, I'd say that Final Fantasy VI is the better game, but I guess I just proved it's not. All hail the new king. Except, I'm not done. Here's the thing, I want to be absolutely analytical about these comparisons, and I am. But I've spent at least 20 hours, probably closer to 30 hours, playing both of these titles. I still like Final Fantasy VI more, I always have, and the characters have meant more to me. The final boss is someone I truly love taking down every time. I love the Esper system, even if it is a bit weaker. But if this is analytical, I think I have to come up with a reason. And I think there is one other thing that Final Fantasy VI has. That's right, we're going to be going to sixth round optional content. The fact is Final Fantasy IV kind of does have this, and if you and I play Final Fantasy IV, we get a similar story, and while there are a few optional items or encounters in the game, there's nothing that important that you can miss. Even cutscenes are pretty hard to miss, the important ones, and I'm sure some people will bring up one-offs like Yang's wife, but it's not the same thing. On the other hand, it's really rather easy to miss pieces of Final Fantasy VI. I've played this game multiple times, but in this playthrough, I chose to go left instead of right on the Phantom Train and missed a small location. There are several enemies that players may never encounter, and while that's only a bestiary entry in most titles, in Final Fantasy VI it means that Gao will never be able to encounter those enemies and get the rage abilities, which for a completionist may be very annoying. I know it was for me. There are also choices where players can choose an amazing weapon or an esper that teaches a one-of-a-kind magic ability. The answer is, of course, the magic ability, but part of me loves that choice because it tempts me every single time. 
And then there's the optional content that may or may not be seen on each playthrough, which only means players will feel compelled to play the game a second or a third time in different ways. I know I have. And in an era without YouTube, you probably also would be able to find new pieces of the game by replaying it over and over. Even rumors about how to save certain characters persisted because, well, maybe it was possible. I mean, there was so much optional content. This does extend to the endgame content, which is also why I tend to play this game for 40 hours or more, and that's not even trying to get Ebi Gal Rage or Ebi Strago lore. Granted, I did abuse a little frame skip in this game, but the point is, this is a game that will let you sink far more hours into it, and it may even require a full replay depending on exactly what you're looking for. So maybe Final Fantasy VI is the better game. But I still feel wrong. You see, Final Fantasy IV was the first Super Nintendo Final Fantasy. It wasn't intended to be the biggest and the best. It wanted to be a solid narrative on a better system and did it better than most, possibly even better than Final Fantasy VI that came out years later. The story is still amazing after all these years and all those cutscenes sell the experience. You're part of the story rather than just watching someone else play it out. But then again, Final Fantasy VI is a game that I would gladly play for almost double the amount of time as IV, and part of me wants to just go chase the full completion run that I miss almost every time. It's a game that feels like it could be infinitely replayable. We're tied up after six rounds, so probably we'll need a tiebreaker. And you know, I don't think we do. The real magic of both of these titles is that they both do amazing things that show off why the 16-bit era was a time of change for the RPG genre, but they also show different things. If you want an epic story with the core characters shining and all of them evolving into heroes and heroines, Final Fantasy IV is the way to go. But if you prefer a more colorful cast and want an ensemble story with more intrigue and want to chase that optional content, well that's an easy choice. Final Fantasy VI every single time. So really, the tiebreaker is what you, the player, really want, and the fact is, this can actually change every time you pick up one of these titles. At the end of the day, they're so different that neither title is truly better, but also neither is worse, which is strange because they're literally on the same system from the same company and with very similar teams. There's a reason I chose to replay both of these titles, and sure, making a video was always an interest, but I also got to play two of my favorite games in one of the best formats, so you really can't go wrong with either title. Also, retro achievements. And as a confession, I never played Final Fantasy IV's sequel or the interlude, so that doesn't really matter here, but you know, enjoying both of these titles makes me wonder if it's time that I make a change and try those two out. So that's what I have. Maybe a week ending for a head-to-head -head battle, and like I said, I still prefer Final Fantasy VI, but this video really has made me appreciate Final Fantasy IV. So let me know down in the comments which of these is your favorite and why. I did miss out on a few pieces that I didn't know where to put them. The Realm Sketch Glitch, for instance, which actually made me return my first copy of Final Fantasy III because I thought it was broken. You Spoonie Bard, which is still a classic line. The Turbo Button on the Letty River for leveling. The fact that Rydia, Palum, and Porum are vastly underage to take into battle. Like, what the frig, Cecil? But at least he didn't hit on them like a certain other king. But you know, all this stuff is mostly just things you should discover on your own if you haven't yet. Even if you have played both of these titles, why not give them a second playthrough? I think I've proven both titles are worth it. With that said, thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and ringing that bell. Throwing a like would help me out, of course. And also, share this video with others. Let's convert people who think differently than you. But let me ask you, what do you think I should be comparing next in a head-to-head? -head? I'm open to suggestions. I know a lot of people said Binding of Isaac before. I'm a bit scared to do a deep dive into that game, but I'm going to try to. Who knows? Playing through huge titles does take a lot of time, so I'm working with my schedule and seeing what's the best way to keep making great videos for everyone to enjoy, but I am back to it. And also, I promise I'm not going to be doing 18 months of Game Pass videos before the next verses. Yeah, that was a huge detour, maybe even a mistake I could say, but here are two more videos if you want to check out more from me and consider hanging out on the Discord with me. It's just a great place to just be yourself, whoever you are. The link is on the screen and in the description. See you next time.